you will, this morning. We're going to begin, we're, we introduced last time the, the issue of uh, the adversary, and I want to kind of develop that out a little bit this morning with you, and then begin to look at him uh, and his mode of operandi and his, uh, the everything about him, if you will. Uh, not everything, because otherwise we would never get into the good stuff. But just so that you and I are very, uh, we're aware of, of how the, our adversary works, how the accuser of the brethren operates. And I want to just pick up where we left off last week, Isaiah 14 here, and then develop some things out here about the adversary over the next couple weeks. Because you, you and I, we, we tend to live in an encapsule of the Holy Spirit and, you know, we kind of get honed in on who we are in Christ and everything. And then we kind of lose sight of what's going on really behind the scenes. That's why we spent time looking at creation. Then why did God create the natural creation to come and dwell here, to live with creation and, and some of that. And then the adversary kind of went, wait a second, I don't want that to happen, so he's going to do, okay? You need to understand that as you then go and look at the world around us, and as you see what's happening in our country, in our society, but then as you see it happening in the world at large, things are changing. Uh, the, unfortunately, your news outlets, and I say it that way on purpose, because it's no matter where you get your new, isn't, doesn't, isn't able to, doesn't, for whatever, give you all of the details of what's going on. How you know that is call somebody that lives in those countries and ask them, how's it going? And you know what you get? You get a completely different picture than what you see on the Internet or on TV or whatever. Why? Because people live in it. We were in Minnesota uh, two weekends ago, and I got a question about, well, how is it with the border being open and all this stuff? And I go, we don't notice it here. And they're like, what? Really? I go, no. I go, because that's, now, if we were in Tucson or Nogales, a little different, because we're in that. We're not here. And they didn't quite grasp that idea, because what, what do they see on the news? They see that bridge in Texas and all the people, and it's like, but that's not reality. You and I need to live in a world of reality. You got Isaiah 14? Run to Ephesians 6, just, you, you know how I work, which is chaotically sometimes. Mon Monday night we were going and I told the kids go one, the kids, I told the young adults go one way and then I went two other ways. And they're like, all right, hang on a minute, and scratch, and poor Kaylee's sitting there and she's scratching and I'm like, don't scratch it out, I'll get there, just, you know, put a one by it, you know, here went here first. Look at Ephesians 6, look at verse 12. For we wrestle not against what? Isn't that interesting? See, our battle isn't with other people. It isn't, our, our, our conflict isn't with others. Now, it appears to be that way at times. But against principalities, against powers, against the what? Rulers of darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness. See, our warfare is with spiritual wickedness in high places. Our warfare is on a spiritual basis. Now, in person, in time, you know, you get behind the guy going slow in the left lane, and what are you going to do? Get out of the way. Move over, you know, and give him the, the right hand of fellowship. Now, let's go. Here we go. Boom, you know. But the thing is, is that's not the conflict. Now go back to Isaiah 14. I want you to grasp the issue of where the real conflict is. And doing this with an understanding that not everybody's going to be here and so forth. You know, winter's here for us, and it's time to get out of town, it's time to do, or it's time to hunker down. You know, I've lost weight, almost 45 pounds, I think. And I'm finding myself getting cold. Like, wait a second, why am I cold? You know, where are my socks? You know, and before it wasn't that way at all, you know. It's like, holy cow. Anyway, Isaiah 14. Here's, here's Satan's, verse 12, Isaiah 14, 12. Here's Satan's original 
plan. And I want us to think about this so that we can have an understanding of, of how this is all, the world about us, our culture, our society, our neighbors, all of this is working and why it's working the way it is. And I want to look at the passage here carefully with you over the coming weeks. This passage, Isaiah 14, it, the whole of the passage is a prophecy about Israel, about the little flock, over in the 70th week of Daniel, so in the tribulation as they go through some things, and as the second coming happens, and as the, the kingdom is introduced to them, if you look there at verse 7, the whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon say, Since thou art laid down, no feller is come up against us. That's the kingdom. When they get into the kingdom, guess what? The king's on the throne. There's no more war. It's there. But now look at verse 8. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. Now he moves to talk about the beast, the Antichrist, the adversary. Verse 12, O oh, how art thou fallen from heaven, who? O oh, Lucifer. So we're, we're, we're getting a look into the little flock in Israel as they go through. But here now specifically, as the Lord, the king, the righteous judge, goes over and takes Lucifer... Satan, he becomes Satan, the devil, the dragon, Leviathan, all those names, and is literally going to cast him off into the lake of fire one last time. And Israel, the, the believing remnant, is going to sit there and say, na na boo boo look at you, don't you remember? Back there, Genesis 1-2, what you said. Look at this. And I say Genesis 1-2, actually it's 1-1 and 1-2, there's a little time in there. Look at this. Don't, O oh Lucifer, how art thou fallen from heaven, O oh Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? And that's what we looked at last week, those four institutions and the nations. And Satan's whole goal is to weaken what God has set up and established in the earth, in creation. And he's got an attack mode. And he's going to lay it out for us here. And he does it in, in really just five simple little points. But notice verse 12. He's son of the morning. You know, Phil led you through some of that in, when he taught about how the new Bibles change that. But son of the morning, he's a light bearer. That's who he is. You, you get over in Ezekiel 28 and you read his description. And he's got all of this light about him. And all, he's got that built-in... Uh, orchestra. He's got all of these things that are in him because his job as the cherub that covereth, Ezekiel 28, his job was to hold up the torch of light and truth in creation. His job was to hold up, here's the truth, here's the light, here's what the Word of God is, and we're going to worship God, the Godhead. And he would devise mechanisms and devise methods of worship in worshiping Jehovah, in worshiping God in the creation. That was his job. And as he hovered over and as he covered over the throne room, he begins to look down. And you go read Revelation, and we're not going to do this today, but it, we will do it eventually. If not, I, at least I said it to you, right? In Revelation 4, and he describes the throne room, and that floor is like a sea of glass. It's a looking, and as he gets down and he looks down, we're going to see as we go here, he begins to see his own beauty. He begins to see himself, and he says, you know what? I will, I'm going to be like the Most High. That's my plan. But notice in verse 12, O Lucifer, I love that, son of the morning. See that word Son. That's a trigger. That's an indicator. The angels are called sons of God. That's a trigger, an indicator that God has always intended his creation to be populated by sons, by adults. And what adults do is they understand what he's doing and know what he's doing 
and then go and delight in doing that. That's what an adult does. That's what a son of God does. That's, by the way, sons of God, angels, John 1, Israel, he was giving Israel the power to become the sons of God, John 1, 11, and 12. And then in Romans 8, he looks at us and says, you know what? You're a son. You're a son of God. You're an adult. And adults act like adults. Adults learn. They don't know it all, you know. I, I mentioned last week we were talking just beforehand about learning how to reload and do the ammo and all that stuff. You see, <laughs> I was talking to, I don't know if you guys remember Don Hunt. He used to come and camp health-wise. And I was talking to him. He had given me a little set of stuff. And he says, whatever you do, buy a manual. Go find manuals. And I'm like, all right, anyone specific. I talked with Jerry Dent. He's like, get a manual. So here I am at Goodwill going through the books, you know. They didn't have any. Go to secondhand bookstore. They got like three of them. I bought all three. And then I get home and I find out it's all the same, just different editions. And I'm like, you know what? I got them. Can't pull one over on me. I give, you know, then you get online. You know, why? Because you got to have what? Information. You take this and you weigh it and you got this and that. You got a whole, and you're learning. I'm 50, one, two, something like that. And what do you do? You're learning. You're constantly learning as adults. Just because you're an adult doesn't mean you know it all. It means that you're going to behave. There's going to be an interaction between you and the Godhead on this level. You know what you do with children? You discipline them. You set the house rules, and you mold them, and you move them, and you do. But when they become adults, Galatians 4, what do you do? You say, okay, you still got the rules and you ought to be doing, but we're going to deal with you in as an adult. We're going to have adult conversation rather than little kitty conversations. By the way, you notice that in Paul's epistles. Look at how he interacts with the Corinthians and the Galatians. They are what? Children. They're babes in Christ. What do you do with the kid? Discipline. Spank them. Get them. Gut them. But then when you go over to Philippians and Colossians, adults, mature believers, perfect he calls both. He, do, he doesn't yell at them. He says, let's have a conversation here. You're terrified by your adversaries. Why? What's going on? How do you think about this? Why? Because you deal with people differently. Here is the son of the morning. He's the top creature in the creation. He's over it all, leading. He's a son. And God wants sons to administer his government in the universe. And again, the result is the end of verse 12 which did us weaken the nations. Now watch verse 13. For thou hast said in thy heart. That's past tense. He already said this. Back in the fall, when he fell, he says this. Here's my plan. Here's my, my purpose. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt. Notice my throne. You see, he's got a throne. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And you take Genesis 14, verse 18 and 19, and that term, the most high, is defined for you as the possessor of heaven and earth. What does... Satan want to do? What does Lucifer want to do? He wants to take his throne, his ruling and reigning, and put it above everything else. He wants to be top dog. Now, he doesn't say, I want to be God. He says, I want to be like the Most High. Why? He knows he's not God. He's clear as a bell on who he is and what he is. He just has a plan doesn't he? He's got a mechanism here. His intention is to sit on, the, on his throne that's going to run heaven and earth. That issue there in verse 13 about, I will, uh, I will ascend into heaven. Where's he going? Notice it's heaven. It's up. He's not, if I get heaven, then what do I have? I got the earth too. Let's go get that first. Then we'll get this. 
Then he says, I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. There's a place in the universe in the sides of the north. It's got a title, Mount of the Congregation. You look, when you study that stuff out and you get into it, you find out that that, congreg- that place is going to sit here on the earth and it's going to be in the north end of the kingdom. And it's a place where the, ki- the children, the, the angelic realm, come and give an accounting for it. Do you remember Job 1? Go over to Job 1. You're looking at me like you're, mm, I'm saying stuff you don't remember. Look at Job 1. Did I lose you? There's so much here, folks. And honestly, we could spend the whole hour or eight or nine just in these verses, and I don't want to, but look at Job 1, or Job. Justin's here this morning. Job. Job 1. Job 1. Look at verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God, the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So let me ask you something. The sides of the congregation of the north, where they come to give an account, is that in the second heaven or the third heaven? has to be in the second heaven because who showed up? Satan did. He's not allowed into the third heaven, the home of the Lord, God's home. So in the, in the north side of the universe, in the second heaven, that second firmament, that closed firmament, where we talked about this a couple weeks ago, a month ago now probably, so it's a place where all of the angelic, come back to Isaiah 14, angelic realm is going to come in and give an account, and who showed up? Satan. Actually, the next verse Next couple verses, the Lord asked him, where you been? He goes, I've been down in the earth walking to and fro. So he's, he's got access to what? The universe as we know it. Heaven, second heaven, and the earth. Isaiah 14. He's got a plan. His plan is to ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most. That's his plan. Okay? Now, his plan's got a name. Come over to Revelation 17. Revelation 17. By the way, there in Isaiah 14, verse 15, the conclusion of that is, Thou shalt be brought down to the hell to the sides of the pit. The conclusion of his plan is uh, destruction. (laughs) It's not a good thing. So when you buy into the plan, when you buy into the lie program of the adversary, when you leave truth and you go over to the dark side, When you leave and you do that, you know what you begin to do? It's going to be destruction. It's going to be turmoil. It's going to be judgment. So what you got to do is understand that and stay over here where you belong. Okay? Look at Revelation 17. Look at verse number 5. The adversary understood, Satan, Lucifer, understood what God was doing in the universe. Okay? And the key to the mystery, did I give you that reference? I didn't, did I? Doggone it. Did I give you on the handout 1 Corinthians 2? Okay. I know I said Revelation 17. Run back to 1 Corinthians 2. You got to catch this. I'm sorry. A little scatterbrained here this morning. Alabama lost, so I don't know what to do. I had all black on this morning, and Linda told me, no, you can't do that. So... But uh, look at 1 Corinthians 2, and look at verse 7 and 8. Because you need to understand something. Satan understood what God, was going, what God was going to do in the universe. But he didn't understand all of it. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. For we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, what's the it? The, the hidden wisdom of God. That's the it. The it isn't the cross. The it is, verse 7, the hidden wisdom of God. They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You see, Satan, now go to Revelation 17. The adversary understood what God was doing, but the key to the mystery issues is that he didn't understand how God was going to accomplish what he said he was going to accomplish. That's the hidden wisdom. You see, how was God going to accomplish the whole program? 
The, ca- the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ was going to do it. Satan doesn't understand what God was doing, was going to do through the cross work. He knows that Christ is going to die. It's prophesied. It's been talked about. He just didn't understand what that event meant. So when God reveals the mystery truth, progressive revelation to the Apostle Paul, Satan ends up doing the very thing that was his undoing. What did he do? He went and crucified Christ. But he didn't know that. Why? Because God kept a secret. And that's key to all of this. Now, Revelation 17, verse 5. Here's the program's name. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery. Now notice there's a comma. Babylon the Great, comma. The mother of harlots and abomination of the earth. First of all, that's her title. When he says upon her forehead. That goes back up to verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had seven vials and talked with me saying, Unto me, come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, and with whom the kings of this earth have committed fornication, and inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit and wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blaspheme and having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was the name written. Now, what he just described is religion. It's the religious system. It's that vain, empty system in Scripture. It's called Baal worship, and it's there. But what I want you to notice is look at her name. What's that first big-lettered word? (laughs) Mystery. Do you ever wonder why Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 says that the mystery of iniquity doth already work? And you go, huh? That's because mystery is what? Her name. She's going to work in a secret in a mysterious way. She's going to work in a way that isn't evident. It's going to be hidden. There's going to be a hidden agenda here. It isn't going to be out front. It isn't, you know, so a guy asked me many years ago, he goes, Rick, when you do this, what do you do? And, so, and I said, look, I'm an open book. You want to know how we do things? I'll tell you. I'm not, I have no hidden agenda. Here it is, Okay. And he's like, oh, okay, I can respect that. You know what the adversary says? Oh, no, I have a hidden agenda, and it's a mystery. It's mystery. Then there's the description of her, Babylon the Great. You know where this started? Where we ended last week in, in Genesis 11 with Nimrod and Baal and Babel and the confounding of the languages and Nimrod and and blatant rebellion against the word of God says, don't scatter, come, I'll take care of you, I'll provide, I'll do for you. And they had the one world government, the one world language, the one world religion. And we looked at all of that, that internationalism, which is the attack of nationalism laid out by God. And it goes all, so you know where this stuff starts? Back there. And it goes all the way across history of, of time. Back to Nimrod and the rebellion, and God confounding the language. Now come back to Ezekiel 28. So we have a description of, by the way, uh, the mother of of harlots and the abomination, the mother of harlots, she's the source. The harlots are all the other little offspring. You've heard Ezekiel 28. We'll look at this next time, next week maybe tease you to come back and see if I can do something straight. The mother of harlots. Have you ever wondered why there's so many religious groups out there in the world? Right there. She spawned them. The system. Satan's plan spawns them. Off they go. That's why Paul, again, 2 Thessalonians 2, he say all that is worshipped is going to come and bow down to the Antichrist as he sits there on the throne as God. And everybody goes, oh, the Muslims won't do it. Oh, no, they'll be the first ones in line because they're a spawn. 
They're, she's the mother of harlots. She's the mother church. Here's the mother philosophy. Here's the grounding root. You guys okay? That I, I haven't lost you, I hope. <laughs> if not, just rewind the tape. <laughs> Ezekiel 28. In Ezekiel 28, we have a great description of Lucifer. But now as Satan, it starts there in verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation unto him, uh, upon the king of Tyrus, sorry, and say unto him, Thou say, uh, thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum of full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. So, real quick, this is going to the king of Tarsus, but who, the verse says he was in the garden of God. Well, the dude that sits there on as the king wasn't in the garden. Who was in the garden? The Godhead, Adam and Eve, and Satan, Lucifer, well, Satan. So when he says, take up a lamentation to the king, he's not talking about the dude standing in front of him. He's talking about who? The guy behind him pulling the strings. We had, there's a big thing, you know, you get into politics and, oh, who's really pulling the strings? Well, here's the dude that's really pulling the strings of all of it. And he says, you, look at verse 12. Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect of beauty. And then there's a description. I'll drop down to verse 15. Uh, verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, now watch, till iniquity was found in thee. He starts out how? Perfect. He starts out as the sum of full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He starts right till something happened. Verse 15. Till iniquity was what? Found in it. Until he, he rebelled. Rebellion came into his heart. And that's where sin enters in to the universe is right there. Now, historically, it falls between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. I know there's a great thing out there about the gap theory and all that, and I don't. I have struggles with some of it on both sides of the equation. I just know in order to, you have to place the fall of Lucifer somewhere, and it fits right there because of what Genesis 1-2 says. I don't, uh, I, a guy wanted to argue with me one time about, well, how long is the gap between 1-1 and 1-2? I said, I said you, you don't know that. And he gave me some mathematical, algebraic, geographic, geometry-looking thing. And I said, that doesn't, that is nothing. There's not a verse that says it was excellent. It, there's just what? He fell somewhere that caused the earth to be without form and void. Judgment. So you figure it out. We can talk about it another time. Where did sin enter into the universe? Right there. What did he do? Till iniquity was found in thee. By the way, just kind of an offshoot, that word iniquity, everybody wants to define iniquity. Iniquity is always associated with the satanic policy of evil. Who's it lined up with here? Satan. And where did it start? Way back there. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Iniquity isn't a broad term. It isn't, it's, a, it's a term that's associated with the rebellion of Lucifer against the Word of God. And there's an association. Now, there's attributes to it and all that. But if you can just remember, when you read iniquity, read what? Isaiah 14, Lucifer's plan. That's where it is. Now, verse 16. Because I need you to catch what's happening here in verse 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of the fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. What got him? Pride did. 1 Timothy 3, verse 6, Paul says, Pride got him. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom. 
by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuary by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold them. Wow. There is a ton of stuff going on in that verse, and you've got to catch the key words, the big words, the big words. Verse 16, verse 17, verse 18. He's lifted up by pride because of thy, what, beauty. You know what he does? He sees his beauty, verse 13 there. He knows he's full of the sum of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He looks around creation and he says, there's no one here like me. I am the top dog. I am the cat's meow. I am the preeminent one in the creatures. There's nobody like me out here. So you know what? I ought to be God. I ought to be in charge. And look at what God says about that. His heart was, was, was lifted up. But look in verse 17. Thou hast corrupted thy what? Isn't that interesting? Wisdom. By reason of thy brightness. He, lo- he corrupted his what? His wisdom. Remember when we looked at, and we went over there in Proverbs, and wisdom was on the table in the blueprint when he created everything? Proverbs 8, Proverbs, please say yes. Thank you. Thank you. Make me feel good. Okay. there's supposed to have been a wisdom in Lucifer to do what? Lead the creation and worship of God. Look at the creator. Here he is. But he's looking down. He's like, I'm top dog. There's nobody better than me. I am it. And he says, you know what? I will be like. And he sinned, verse 16 says. And thou hast sin. Now look, look in verse uh, now verse 18. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuary by the multitude of thine iniquities. Now watch, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Verse 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sin. Do you see how Satan's got a merchandise? You see how he's got to traffic it? Have you ever been in a tourist trap? And they got every little trinket, and the merchandise is all out there set to get you? We were in Montana. Actually, I think we were in Idaho, and I was talking to the young lady behind. I had to get my receipt for gas, and uh, I was talking to her, and I said, where do the non-tourist people go? And she goes, they're everywhere. I go, okay, so where would you suggest we go do, you know, what we were looking for? And she goes, okay, go down here to this road, turn left, and go to go three streets, turn right, turn. And, and, I'm, we're, and I'm like, so we did it, and I'm like, where are we going? The map's got blank on it, you know. The GPS is, please turn around, you turn, you turn, you turn, you know. And we get back there, and it was beautiful. It was gorgeous. And it was like, I couldn't find it back to tell you where to go. It was just wonderful. And actually going backwards, we didn't go the way we came, you know, that all that mantra, been there once, I can get back, right. GPS killed that, you know. But he's got merchandise. He's got traffic. He's moving. You think about merchandise. You got to have it, don't you? What's the merchant sell? You got to have that. You need that. The great illustration Dad always used, and I enjoy it, is the car dealer. Going in Chicago, the car dealer, out front of the car dealer was always a pothole for two or three. Why? Because you're driving along in your old car, and you hit the pothole, and you go, man, this thing's right. And you look over, and there's a new car. Well, that new car would look really good, and pfft, right in you go. What do you, what's, think about merchandising. You, you guys in business and stuff, what are you trying to do? You're trying to sell something. His heart's been lifted up. He's, been, he's corrupted his wisdom, so he's developed his own wisdom plan, his own wisdom program, his own way of doing things. He comes in, verse 16, verse 18, and he's got a traffic. He's got a marketing ploy. 
He's got this plan to get it out there, and he's merchandising it. He's selling his product, and his promise is to fill people with all kinds of merchandise. Now, his audience is the angelic realm right now, okay? Here. Man hadn't been developed yet, or created yet, developed. Created. Well, that'll get me in trouble. Created yet. And what he does is he looks around at the angelic realm and he says, I have stuff, and you need it. Actually, it, you'll enjoy it. It'll benefit you. It'll lift you up. All you have to do is come and pay me. You know, you go into the store and you go, you know, the souvenir store, you can't just walk out with it. What do you got to do? You got to pay the lady. You got to pay. You pay it, you take it. You're on your way. You see, his plan, when he's after the angelic realm here, is come, join me, and you know what? We'll be the top. We will be like the Most High. We'll, it'll benefit you. Just join. Come on. You know you want it. You know you need it. Have you guys seen the shows on? You guys don't stay up late, but the old info commercials, first it's this copper pan, now it's a silver pan. It's just the copper one painted silver, but it's the same thing. It's a news. If you buy one today, 25 minutes, we'll get you five and all this stuff. Why? Because gener- that's what he did. Now, you see verse 18? Let me just say this in passing because we're here because we need to move on. But you see in verse 18 where he says, Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. That right there is Matthew 25, 41 in the creation of hell. In Matthew 25, 41, the Lord says to the, to the nations out there in the judgment of the nations at the end of the 70th week, or at the end of the uh, 70th week there in the second coming, and he says, hell was prepared for who? The devil and his angels. And that's where it is. So in order to stop the rebellion in heaven, what did God do? He did something that none of them anticipated, and he created a place that could hold them. A spiritual entity called hell, the lake of fire. That it hold, And you know what it did? It put a choice in front of the angelic realm of life and peace or torment and trouble. Right? Think about that. God's wisdom plan, now Satan develops a wisdom plan. Everybody, what's going to benefit me the most? Don't you do that? You look at insurance companies, one benefit, the other benefit. Which one gets me the best bang for the buck? And you know what God said? You guys that follow him, that's your end result. Okay, we're done. Uh Uh-uh, ain't going to do that. You lost. 41, Matthew 25, 41. I'm sorry. Just kind of... Run through the thinking here. Now, you're in Ezekiel 28. His plan, the adversary's plan, look at verse 16, was to usurp the wisdom plan of God with a competing wisdom plan. Now, look at verse 16 carefully. But the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with what? With violence, and thou hast sin. His plan that he sold to the universe, what's its characteristic? Violence. Never peace. Never a situation of harmony. It's all of what? Violence. Satan is sitting not on a peaceful kingdom, by the way, when, when God establishes his kingdom, what's going to rule and reign in the earth? Judgment and peace. Righteousness. Satan's sitting on a, he's sitting on a pressure cooker. You know what those do? A little knob gets going. Pressure builds up. He's doing his dead level best to keep the cap on it. No peace. But yet Satan is crafty enough, he's wise enough, he's sneaky enough to keep it all under control, to keep a lid on it. 
People have this idea that Satan's just kicked back and enjoying life. He is not. Because it's a kingdom of violence. Now, run up to verse 3. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. Wow, I wish we had two hours to look at that. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. And that's the secret to his tactic. You think you can fool him. The problem is, is your foolish thought he wrote the book on. He wrote the manual. It's called The Course of This World. He set it forth. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasure. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Satan has gone out. His selling tactic, he knows everything. He knows the secret stuff. By the way, it's fascinating that God kept a secret from him. And that's what undid him. (laughs) He had a plan to entice creation. Come over to Genesis 3. And he did that plan. And it worked in the angelic realm until God created hell. Judgment. Hell was never created for man. It was created to stop the rebellion in the angelic host. It was created to put angels and the angelic host in judgment. So now we have the six days of creation, and there's man created on the sixth day, Genesis 3. And you have the whole the issue there of going out and looking and doing and subdue the earth and reclaim the earth back under the authority and man, Adam, you go be my representative in earth in creation, and you get this job done. Satan's watching that. He goes, I'll get this turkey. It ain't going to be a sweat off my brow. Man, dealing with those guys wore me out. This is going to be easy. And as God lays in the test of their volition, they, really the test in the end of Gen- in Genesis 2 there is, are you going to believe me or not? Are you going to obey my word or not? That's really what it is. But look at Genesis 3. And look at verse 1. Satan created an... And he created a need in others to need him. That's what he's after. And when the need isn't real, he's got to work in a a subversive manner, a hidden agenda. 3.1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. See that word subtle? Sneaky. Not out here going, hey, this is what we're going to do. Not at all. What does he do? And he said unto the woman, by the way, serpent there, it's not a snake wrapped around the tree, it's an apple tree, by the way, it wasn't an apple tree, it was a grapevine. It was not, it's a personification of his character. Just as in Revelation when they say, behold the Lamb of God, it's not a four-legged man going there. It's a personification of the sacrificial Evidence of what the Lord did at Calvary. The serpent. Here's a description of his character. So think about that. He went from Lucifer, son of the morning, top angelic dog, top creator, to not crawling down on the belly, slithering around in wagon ruts. But what did he say to the woman? Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree, of the garden. Notice every time everything that Satan says to the woman. It's very fascinating. When you're going to read Eve verse 2 and the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Now, that's not what God told them. First of all, God never told him that the tree was in the midst of the garden. Somebody had to tell her it was where? In the midst of the garden. Then he said, he never said, you couldn't touch it. You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So she adds in legalism, touching it. But then she left out, but of the trees of the, uh, uh, but the fruit of the tree, which is, uh, I'm sorry, verse 2, we may eat of the fruit of the tree. He says, freely eat 
So she left out grace and added the law. She's a mess. Eve's all twisted up, and that's going to be critical here. So she adds touch, leaves out freely, takes away God's grace, adds in the legalistic performance-based stuff. She adds the thing that God didn't tell them to do, so she isn't grounded in the truth. That's the point here. That's why Satan went to her. There's a headship thing there. There's all that, yes, but he goes after the weakest link, and guess what? She's the weak link. Now, verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, watch what he says, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's... What's that next word? Knowing good and evil. He's going to lay a lie onto her in verse 4 and 5 that she can't handle. She's not equipped to handle it. And husbands, you need to make sure your wives are equipped to handle this attack. Okay? Because that's where... You remember, Paul, silly women laden with sins and everybody... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Why? Because that's where he's going after. Peter calls her the weaker vessel and weaker in, uh, not, you know, physically able. I mean, good grief, you can have kids. Uncle, I give, you know. But weaker in, in order of authority. Notice this carefully. Here is what the lie is. Here's the merchandise. Here's the trafficking of the idea here. What does he say, verse 5? For God doth know. See that knowing, knowledge, wisdom? There's a question that God has left out, Eve. There's information that God didn't give you. Eve, Eve, come here, come here, come here, quick. Look, I know what God said to you, but yea, did he really say that to you? Think about a slick salesman, you know. He's selling it. But what's he selling? I know something that you don't know. I really know what God's doing. You don't know that. I really know. Look at what he said, verse, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as what? God's with the little g. Knowing good and evil. He looks at Eve and he says, Eve, God didn't tell you about everything. And if you join me, league up with me, I'll give you the decoder ring to figure it out. Your eyes will be opened. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't say, just rebel and come over here and we'll have a good time and the lust of our activities. He says, no, there's a piece of wisdom. There's a piece of information. Come over to Isaiah 33. There's a piece of something here that God didn't tell you. He didn't want you to know. And I know something God doesn't want you to know. And you can know it if you join me. Now think about God with Adam. God tells Adam, here's the deal. Now go educate, Isaiah 33. Now go educate Eve. Adam did a poor job educating Eve. She was not able to. She was not equipped to handle the lie. What she should have said was, hang on a minute. Let's talk to my hubby here, Adam. Now, by the way, Adam's standing right there. Adam didn't say, Get thee behind me, Satan. Boom. He didn't say that. He just watched it happen. So he's weak too. That's, but really think about that. Adam wasn't weak. He just spent the cool of the day with the Lord. Think about that. Day six, he's, he's created. The seventh day, the Sabbath day is rest, day of rest. It's all, it's all that. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, him and the Lord spend all day together. 
educating Adam and learn and this and that. And then on the Thursday, on Thursday, the fifth day of the week, they fall. The day of Calvary, they fall. Five days, the de- number of death. Because the next Saturday, the Lord was coming back, going to dwell with man. Thursday, boom, done. Well, we'll figure that out now. And you think about this, and you go, think about what Satan's doing here. He's dangling the pretty little carrot in front of her. And it isn't things, it's you don't know something. You've, God is holding something back to you. Now, was he holding anything back from Adam and Eve? No. He had given them everything. They just couldn't eat of one issue over here. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a whole different study, okay? Look at Isaiah 33. Because the, here, here's the idea. Isaiah 33. Look at, look at verse, verse 5. By the way, remember Revelation 17, 5? What's the first title in her name? Mystery? Something Hidden, secret, hidden wisdom, hidden understanding that you can have if you get associated with Satan and his program. Do you know that 99% of what happens can be true? It's the 1% of the lie that will nail you every time. That's where we're at. Now look at Isaiah 33, 5. The Lord is exalted, for he dwelleth on high. He hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Look at that. uh, By the way, they're looking prophetically to the end of Israel, last days of Israel, okay? Where is stability and strength? Where does it lie? In wisdom and in knowledge. You need to think about this verse. Take it to heart. If you want your salvation to be in Christ Jesus, you want who you are in Christ to be the strength in your life, the the center of everything about your life, then you're going to need some wisdom and knowledge. That's going to come out of the Word of God rightly divided as you begin to learn about who he made you. You want to, stability is a great thing. That's why Paul would say, I don't want you to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Tossed to, have some stability. Where's it going to come? It's going to come when he works through his word and you, as it fills your heart with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Knowledge is the, the basic foundational block of everything. Having the information. What you learn, that's what's key. You know what Eve didn't have? Stability. She couldn't handle the lie when it came up to her. Satan laid the trap out. He laid it out there to her, and it got her. That's how he works. He's a smooth operator. He's subtle, is right. He's a sneak. She didn't have the basic knowledge to defend against it. That's why in Romans 6, you don't have to go there. Go to Deuteronomy 29. Ay, time is just clicking away. Are you guys okay? Look at Deuteronomy 29. That's why in Romans 6, the verses I gave you there, verse 3, verse 6, verse 9, Paul says, knowing this, know this, no, no, no. And then verse 11, he says, reckon. You see, you can't reckon something until you know it. And that's where Eve was. Look at Deuteronomy 29. You want to have your life stable. you got to get your nose in the book, find out what God's doing today, learn something about who you are in Christ, and then you know what will happen in your life? Stability will come in, and it will begin to smooth down some of the rough edges. That's why we say read three chapters a day, Romans to Philemon. <laughs> you know, the rest of the book's important, but those books are critical to what? Stability. Deuteronomy 29, 29, quickly. 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. 
God's talking to Israel through Moses. And what does, he, what does he say? All you need to know has been what? Revealed. The secret things over there you don't need to worry about. Now, what did Satan say to Eve? You need to worry about the secret things. Because God kept something back from you. And you need the decoder ring that is only sold in my Apple Jacks box, my Cracker Jacks box, and you need to be buying it, so you need to give me your everything. All you need to worry about is what he told you, is what Moses is saying. I'll come over to 2 Corinthians 3. All, you don't need to worry about the secret things. The revealed is what he wants you to know. So, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 12, Paul says it this way. I'm sorry, that is 1 Corinthians 3, unless I wrote it wrong. Nope, it is. Go to 2 Corinthians. Uh, man, where's the plainness of speech? Oh, I read the wrong, I read the wrong verse. Dog done it. That's a momentum killer. Don't worry. 2 Corinthians 3.12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great, what? Plainness of speech. You know what Paul says? Use the plainness of speech. Easy to understand. This isn't hard. You know what the hardest thing about God's word? Believing it. That's the hardest thing. Read it all day long, you got it. Boom. But believing it. Look over at chapter 11. And we'll stop here because you guys have been patient. Beyond patience. 11.3. You see, the adversary, I will be like the Most High. What's he want to be? He wants to be in charge. So he developed a wisdom plan. We call it the lie. Pro, the lie, the lie. Uh, that comes out of Romans 1, verse 25, where they take the truth of God and turn it into a lie and worship the creature more than the creator. That's what he did. And he looks out there and he says, hey, do you want to be part of my group? So you get the Illuminati, and you get the Da Vinci Coders, and you get this, and you get all this stuff, and everybody's got a secret, 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 and, you know, there's a code to the Bible. And so buy our book so you can decipher the code and do all this stuff, and it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Now, there is a code in the Bible, but God wrote the code. <laughs> These guys are oh, over here doing this and looking in, and, ooh, everything's a conspiracy. Do you know that you know who the original deep stater was? Lucifer. He's the original deep stater. He's the guy pulling the strings on the course of this world. Ooh. Sorry, it's not Biden. Sorry. It's not these guys, it's not those guys. It's this guy and you need to be aware of how he works. Paul says to these Corinthians, he says, we are not ignorant of his devices. And how he comes in and deals with the world is he's like, he's got this little trinket and it's something you need. And I got it. And if, and if you join me, if you trust me, if you give me your allegiance, I'll help you decode it. Because God, you know, God, yeah, he says he loves you, but he's keeping stuff from you. And what kind of God would do that? I would never do that to you. And yet, what do we read? His kingdom is full of what? Violence. Destruction. So, 11.3. Here it is. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve. Through his what? Subtlety. What did he ultimately do? So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That's his attack. That's how he attacked Eve. He said, Eve, it isn't enough that you're in Christ. You need more than that. God kept a secret from you. Join me. I'll tell you that secret. And we'll put you into the 11th step on the ladder. Higher knowledge. You ever wonder why religions have different steps of enlightenment, illumination? Why? Because of this guy. 
And you know what Paul says? If you don't understand his tactics and how he operates, you're going to get sucked into and away from the simplicity that you have in Christ. Because that's how he got Eve. He made Eve take her eyes off of Christ and look at a little G-God angel jumping up and down, flying around. Think about that. Eve looks around. She can't fly. She goes, I can't leave the ground. Angels up, descending, descending, all this stuff. She goes, well, I want to do that. You ever wonder why man's affinity to fly? It's built in day one right there. I want to do that. And, he, and Satan goes, I can show you. I got the wings out back. We'll get you there. You just got to join me. You got to rebel against, yea, hath God said. And that's ultimately the issue. You see, it isn't winning the Powerball. It's just a little thing of knowledge, of some wisdom. And Paul says, everything you need has been revealed by God in his word to you. You don't need, quote unquote, the secret things. Deuteronomy 29, 29, you don't need that. You need to know the revealed truth. We need to recognize the tactics of the devil. We need to recognize his plan and procedures, and we'll carry on and look at that more next time. Just get the way he, he works in a mystery. Not in a, like God kept keeping a secret, but in a mystery form, sneaks, subtlety, deception. That's why in Ephesians 6, he's called the wiles of the devil. It's not open warfare. It's a secret warfare. And you got to get in there and be the sniper and, and be ready to defend. Okay? All right. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And Lord, I thank you for the folks that come, they sit, they listen, they persevere to the end. And I thank you for them, and I thank them for that so that we can understand what's going on and have a clear thinking about the world about us, so that we would not, as Eve, be beguiled away from the simplicity that we have in you. and But rather we would rest in that, relax in that, enjoy that, and just spend our days here as you tarry to come or as life will give us, being the ambassadors that we are to be for you and being that good representative for your word and for all that's about us. In your name we pray, amen.